In the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we find this encounter, these holy words. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And, and they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. And he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that belong to the emperor and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. There is both grainy home video evidence and a written record in the wobbly script of a 10-year-old that my earliest professional goal was to be President of the United States. Maybe some of you had the same intention. It got off to a rocky start. It all began in Mrs. Gardner's fifth grade class where we had a mock debate during the 1992 presidential campaign between George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Ross Perot. At the beginning of the day, we were asked to divide into three tables based on which candidate we chose to support and defend throughout the day. I watched as my classmates divided almost equally into the Bush and Clinton groups. Never one to shy from a challenge even then, I marched to the Ross Perot table. <laughs> and there I took my seat all alone. Not entirely sure how to pronounce my new candidate's last name. Well, we had 15 minutes to prepare for the debate, and of course, this was before Google, so I delved into the stack of newspaper clippings and magazine articles and position statements that were left for us on the table by our teacher. Confident then that I was prepared for anything, I sat back, crossed my arms, and waited for my opponents. Seven hours later, at home in my kitchen, I stood before parents with tears in my eyes. I had been ordered to share the news with them so that Mrs. Gardner would not, that I had been sent into the hall for 10 minutes during the debate. The reason? punishment for arguing too passionately the relative merits of Ross Perot's agenda and for constantly interrupting my classmates who tried in vain to sneak a word into the conversation. Mrs. Gardner had called it a cool-down period. In my defense, I offer one very important detail. By the end of the class period, three other students had joined me <laughs> at the Perot table. Of course, despite all the help I could offer him, Ross Perot lost that election. It was my first of many political defeats, which included a particularly heated student council vice president election in sixth grade when my opponent turned to 
negative campaign advertising. Still, my deep interest in the political world has proven permanent, even as my vocational path led me in a different direction. I am a preacher, and 26 years later, I am deeply concerned about the tenor and tone of political rhetoric in our nation. Notions or even ideas of reaching across party lines or listening to those with whom we disagree have all but disappeared. Social media has given a public platform to disembodied pronouncements that leave no room for dialogue and require no accountability, and so unwilling or unable to hear perspectives that differ from our own, we tend to move to extremes as we exclusively take in like minded viewpoints. As a pastor, I am particularly concerned about how this tendency has crept into the faith community, creating litmus test congregations where entrenched viewpoints are simply reinforced each week, and everyone leaves feeling good about how right we are and how wrong they are. Regardless of your perspective, don't we all sense that something needs to change? In an equally polarized time, a group of Pharisees sent their disciples, along with some Herodians, to ask Jesus a question. The question was not intended for honest inquiry, but political entrapment. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? It's a brilliant trap, worthy of the cable talk shows. You see, the Pharisees were, were religious leaders. They were passionate about maintaining the purity of their tradition. And, and as the Roman Empire gained power, the Pharisees were stripped of influence over policy making. And so, in retribution, they outlawed the use of, of Roman coins in the temple. That was the one place where they still held authority. The Herodians, on the other hand, as their name suggests, were supporters of the king, Herod. They were responsible for maintaining order, for keeping citizens pacified, for promoting the long-term interests of the empire. The Herodians were more than happy to let the Pharisees deal with the soul so long as Rome was in charge of everything else including taxation. So under Jewish law, is it appropriate to pay taxes to the empire? If Jesus says yes, he is a Roman sympathizer and a traitor to the chosen people of God. If he says no, he is a revolutionary religious zealot a sectarian radical. Yes or no, either or, a brilliant trap. Of course, Jesus doesn't take the bait. He returns the question to sender, then asks to see a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are on this coin? The answer is obvious, the emperor's. Well then, Jesus says, you should give the emperor what belongs to him and give the rest to God. Good enough, Jesus, but what belongs to the emperor and what belongs to God? How does our faith properly interact with our politics? The, the Pharisees and the Herodians are allowed no follow-up questions. They simply slink away dumbfounded, amazed, Matthew says. And so, as a consequence for 2,000 years, followers of Jesus have interpreted these words in diverse ways. 
They have been cited by proponents of church-state separation and by Christian fundamentalists and by oppressive theocratic regimes. They have been used to justify the sectarian separation of religious groups from wider society, but they have also been used to defend attempts to Christianize whole nations. In short, Jesus' evasive response to a taxation question has kept a far more consequential question before us. What belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar? Context matters here. Just a few verses after this brief encounter, the Pharisees return to Jesus. They're armed with another question, another trap. Jesus, which commandment in the law is the greatest? This time, the answer he gives is far more direct and much more comprehensive. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love neighbor. Perhaps these commands should provide the framework for our political theology. People of faith must always keep love as their north star, guiding the way forward with with prophetic power, balanced by gentle humility. The love of God and our call to love our neighbors must define not just how we behave in here, but our politics as well. Now, I believe this means engaging with the issues that define our time. In fact, this has always been the case. The premier preacher in the United States during the Second Great Awakening was a Presbyterian named Charles Grandison Finney. Though it seems an oxymoron in our time, Finney was a Presbyterian evangelist, leading dramatic and successful revivals all over the country in the 1830s. Finney had a profound impact on this church's founding pastor, Henry Ward Beecher. Charles Finney was the first preacher to use an altar call where during his revivals, Folks were invited to come forward to the front of the assembly to to give their lives to Christ, to commit their lives to following Jesus in the world. But the focus of Charles Finney's altar call was not only personal salvation. After coming forward to give his or her life to Christ, The convert was sent to the back of the assembly where they were told that part of that gift included signing up for the abolitionist or women's suffrage movements. Beecher would continue this practice in his own passionate call for the abolition of slavery. The point is clear. The church must never be silent in the face of injustice. Spiritual transformation must always have feet in the real world, and we must never surrender to the temptation to be more committed to partisan loyalty than theological truth. Our deepest devotion belongs always to God, not Caesar. This letter we call 1 Peter was written to Christians living in a kind of exile. The churches in Asia Minor were suffering persecution under the booted heel of the Roman Emperor Domitian. The faith communities were were filled with fear. They were struggling with, with their role in a society hostile to their convictions. Into this context, the words of 1 Peter offer a different kind of command. Always be ready, the author writes, to describe the hope that is in you. 
Always be prepared to, to, to be a witness for your faith, even when doing so causes risk or danger. But Peter's instruction does not stop there, and neither should we. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Be prepared to passionately provide your perspective and to do it reverently. It's easy for us to observe how neglected these commands are in the world out there, the world of media and politics and culture. And I certainly wish that more of our leaders and prominent voices would follow these ancient instructions, but I do feel compelled to remind us all that these words were written to the church. Their intended audience is people like you and me, who are trying to follow Jesus in the world and live as people of integrity and faith. We are the ones who are called to speak with gentleness and reverence. So before we criticize the tone of the conversation out there, let's spend a little time focused on our own discourse. What if we were to choose our words with attention to the values outlined in these verses? What if we were to, to listen with open heart and mind and speak with genuine compassion and honesty? There is no debating that civility is lacking in our nation. But civil discourse begins in our own speech. It extends to the words we accept from others. What if we refuse to listen to hateful and dishonest rhetoric even when it affirms our perspective? What if we held our leaders accountable to standards of honesty and kindness? What if we began that accountability with those with whom we agree? What if we refuse to support a politic centered on insulting the other side? <laughs> now, I know what many of you are thinking. That's impossible. We have the politicians we have. We are where we are. If that's what you're thinking, you are certainly right. Here we are in a culture of hateful rhetoric and shouting voices that leave no room for genuine dialogue. And yet, if people of faith cannot envision another reality, then we have lost the core of our vision. You see, a different reality is what we're all about. Bill Moyers, before he was a PBS journalist, you might know he served as special assistant to President Lyndon Johnson. One Sunday evening, Moyers was invited to the White House for dinner, and since he is an ordained Baptist minister, President Johnson asked him if he would bless the meal. Moyers said yes, and as he was praying, the president could not quite hear him. And irritated, as President Johnson could get, the president said to Moyers, Bill, I can't hear you over here. Speak up, man, speak up. Moyers raised his head and calmly responded, Mr. President, with all due respect, I am not speaking to you. With that, there was a very long pause. The president was silent. Finally, he lowered his head for the rest of the prayer. As another president reminded us in a time of deep division, the Almighty has his own purposes. Recently, I read where Christian historian Martin Marty has observed this contemporary paradox People who have strong convictions are not very civil. And those who are civil often do not appear to have strong convictions. 
What we need, Martin Marty says, is a convicted civility. In a time when honest dialogue has been replaced by self-righteous monologue, maybe we all need to be sent into the hall for a cool-down period. Where is Mrs. Gardner when we need her? (laughs) Perhaps the Church of Jesus Christ is poised to embody convicted civility. Isn't that a movement you'd like to join? Conviction about our faith, passion for seeking a way forward, civility in our interaction with one another and those with whom we disagree, convicted civility. This is our call. In an anxious and overheated time, We must not give in to pressures of polarization or the insipid incivility that drowns out our witness and leaves us unable to unite in kingdom-centered work. Too many faith communities have suffered the paralysis of division because they have given in to the temptation of ideological conformity, red God or blue God. Dialogue requires difference. The call of the church is to start right here to model civil discourse for the world, to share the message of hope and faith we have been given. By now, many of you know that Marilyn Robinson is my favorite writer. In a recent essay, she offers these words that I cling to as the headlines report the latest insult and the talking heads spout half-truths and dire warnings. Here's what Robinson writes. It is easy to forget that there are always as good grounds for optimism as for pessimism. Exactly the same grounds, in fact. That is because we are human. We still have every potential for good we ever had. We are still creatures of singular interest and value, agile of soul as we have always been. To value one another is our greatest safety. And to indulge in fear and contempt will be our gravest error. I need those words right now. Perhaps you do too. There has been too much contempt, too much fear, not enough valuing of one another. It won't be easy to change course, but it is our call. Authentic community in which we disagree and respect each other at the same time. It can, and it must, start right here. Amen.